they have no idea about uh, this current um, very modern state of art approaches to study biological processes. So today I would like to concentrate a little bit on modern developments in this area. So first of all, uh, I was asked to uh, give a little bit of general information also because we can have not only life uh, scientists on this meeting. So first of all, how does ionizing radiation influence a cell? We know that uh, basically it is known for many years that ionizing radiation has two types of effects. Direct effect that um, exactly it's a target. Usually uh, we consider nucleus as a target. However, in the recent years, we know that mitochondria in um, uh, cells of, of all living things and also uh, chloroplasts in plant cells can be targets of ionizing radiation and the recognition finally is given to the um, membranes because uh, as you know membranes is basically an interface a membrane is an interface by which uh, the cell interacts with um, all environment and in other cells so the any damage of membranes leads to induction of uh, signaling cascades and to reaction of all cell or even the tissue as a whole to radiation exposure and we also know that uh, radiation might induce indirect effects. The, there are a lot of arguments currently in, in lecture, uh, sorry, in literature uh, about the size of this effect. If some scientists say that indirect effect is very big, another one says that it's neglectable. However, uh, currently we start to understand that indirect effect is basically a radiolysis of water and the production of reactive oxygen species and currently we know that um, uh, this primary reactive oxygen species which occur after the event of radiation they can induce the production of secondary reactive oxygen species and on maintenance of the stress response far after the stress exposure is, is gone. So indirect effects of ionizing radiation is also extremely important, uh, especially because the oxygen species can uh, provoke, star, uh, can, can um, trigger a lot of signaling cascades in the cell. Um, and basically, in general, uh, radiobiology currently, it's not only medicine, it's not only health. Of course, it is the, main uh, area of uh, radiobiological application it's human health it's nuclear medicine uh, it's the usage of radio pharmaceuticals but also we need to study radiobiology in order to do the space travels because uh, you might know that in space um, all living beings are exposed to different types of irradiation and um, we need to understand how organisms would react on the space travels for instance if we want to go to moon to mars anywhere else also it's a question of ecology because uh, currently on the surface of planet we have a lot of sites where a nuclear accident occur you know chernobyl fukushima Srimai island and um, uh, we have several areas with naturally enhanced level of radioactivity. Today in this lecture, we have an example of such area. And uh, currently, International Atomic uh, Energy Agency started to, to give uh, a special attention or to usage of radiation technologies of radiobiology in agronomy, because uh, the radiation mutagenesis now, it's again, uh, kind of state of art because we can combine it currently with the molecular techniques and um, more than uh, 4,000 of uh, new crop uh, varieties, new crop cultivars was recently introduced to the agriculture of different countries using radiation mutagenesis. So uh, our question is how can we study what happens after we influence cell uh, by ionizing radiation. Of course, it would depend on the type of ionizing radiation. Also, it would depend on the dose, on uh, lead, on everything. And um, how do we know what causes the phenotypic effect? 
Before we used to, uh, let's say, check scientific literature or just use our own guess and to think that this molecule can be a target. So let's explore how this molecule uh, would react to ionizing radiation. Probably we can find the molecular pathway that leads to the phenotype, for instance, to the deterioration of growth to, uh, or sometimes for plants, we can see the stimulation of growth. Or, for instance, uh, which event, which molecular events could lead to the development of um, cancer in the end. So, uh, there are two approaches currently. How can we study these things? It's reductionism and holism. Reductionism con considers that a complex system can be understood by studying its constituent components. And it's very classical way of uh, studying complex systems. As example, Watson and Crick deciphered the structure of DNA and also made conclusions about its role in transmission of hereditary information exactly based on reductionism approach. And um, on the contrary, holistic approach postulates that properties of a higher level system cannot be fully explained by examining only its individual components. So it's like we go that chemistry is Something, it's a little bit bigger than just combination of atoms on physical level. Biology is a little bit bigger than chemistry and then so on and so forth. So the whole organism is something more than just the sum of the parts that make it up. And for example, if you take a cell and you disassemble it into chemical constituents or even to uh, single organelles, it is no longer a cell. It doesn't have the cell function. So just an example that everyone understands. However, the analysis of the whole scene without decomposition it to simpler components can be very challenging, but currently we found some approaches that allow us to see cells, sometimes tissues and living scenes as a whole, not as a combination of molecular pathways. Uh, probably many of you have seen this picture. It's um, the story how six blind people are trying to describe the elephant. So they're allowed to touch the elephant and they need to understand what is that. And the person says it's a snake, spare, fan, wall. So you see, depending where they look, they uh, describe elephant as different scenes, but they can't say that in whole it's an elephant. And for us, unfortunately, it is also a very widespread problem because usually when we study biological processes in irradiated cells, we are looking, let's say, we are looking under the lantern. So we probably know that, for instance, this kinase is involved in the response. So let's check what's going on with this kinase. And we completely lose what triggers the response and the long-term consequences of the response also, because we are looking only on this specific molecule or on several specific molecules. What can be done to improve the situation? Uh, currently, as you can see from this publication in Science, almost 20 years has passed, and um, they postulated the idea of systems biology. Systems biology studies a living organism as a whole scene, as an interacting network of genes, of products of genes, proteins, and on biochemical processes, which are regulated by processes, bioproteins, sorry. And using computer technologies, the bioinformatic technologies, systems biology organize and integrate information from very different levels of organization, and it creates models of uh, living systems. So there are several definitions of system biology. Some just use uh, the term system biology when they talk about combination of different omics level. Some use uh, systems biology only for modeling. So when we create a mathematical model of a process, you can find um, different definitions in the literature. Okay. Uh, but here we will concentrate on the most known levels of uh, systems biology, which are uh, so-called omic technologies. It's uh, genomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, and metabolomics. It is the main four, and there are a lot of others currently. So basically now scientists really like to take anything big, kind of big data, and uh, put the suffix om or omics and call it omics. So you can find connectomics, so for instance, it is the connection of all neuronal cells in the brain. They're called connectomics just because that's a lot. And for instance, glycomics, it's the 
analysis of uh, all carbohydrates, so, so on and so forth, such kind of things. But today we will concentrate on the four main nomic technologies and we will also see some examples how they are already used in our area of research in radiobiology and coal. Uh, in order to this data, even to analyze this data, quite, um, quite powerful uh, computer instruments are needed. And uh, together with the development of omic technologies, the bioinformatics approach was uh, developed. It's an interdisciplinary field okay. of research, and it includes the development of methods and software for the analysis of this biological big data. If you start to think about that, the haploid genome of uh, a human being has um, something around 3 billion of uh, nucleotides. So just imagine how to make a meaningful information from uh, three billion letters for all, or four letters in different combinations. And that is the moment where, where bioinformatics come and helps us. We won't uh, stop on bioinformatics today because it's basically the subject for another lecture. But in the end, I will give some, uh, some links to if you're interested to study more about that. So, and informatics is based, bioinformatics is based on databases. These databases are usually opened and, uh, oh, sorry for that, my cat is screaming. <laughs> and um, uh, these databases are usually open and um, users, scientists incorporate their own raw data to these databases so everyone can use them and to make meaningful biological conclusions. Well, uh, coming back to omic technologies, let's start from genomics. Genomics is an interdisciplinary field of biology. It's focusing on structure, function, evolution, mapping, and also on gene editing. So genetics and genomics, it's two different things. Classical genetics is studies heredity and the genetics studies a single gene, which is a specific DNA sequence on a chromosome. So it studies its function, its structure, how does it interact with another genes. However, genomics studies the entire set of genes of an organism or even of several organisms, if it is comparative genomics and we compare genomes with different organisms. And therefore, a genome includes the entire set of genes of a particular organism and genomics explores all these genes and uh, their interaction with each other. Uh, genomics has um, quite uh, an old history. Let me see if I can use a laser. Yeah, I can. So, at uh, 1953, it basically started when we finally realized that DNA has a double helix structure. And in 1961, the genetic code was deciphered. In 1965, the very first uh, sequencing method uh, um, occurred. It, it's so-called Sanger sequencing. And in 1985, the International Consortium set up to sequence the human genome. So they basically decided that it must be sequenced. And this work was finished somehow only 15 years after, and now we can sequence a human genome in, uh, let's say, two days, or even faster, depending on technology. And uh, in 1986, the Sanger sequencing was improved. The sequencing capacities was um, uh, improved a lot by using of fluorescent dyes. I will stop on it a little bit later. And also in 1995, already was published the first draft of microbial genome. Uh, so that was the start of uh, genomics breakthrough. In 1997, uh, there, the commercialization of capillary sequencing already started. And starting in, in the beginning of 2000s, the development of commercialization of next generation sequencers uh, also occurred all, all over the world and currently for the last let's say 15 years we are using these machines in um, they can be different they can be based on different technologies but on the same idea and currently uh, let's say in 2016 the uh, nanopore the oxford uh, technology oxford nanopore technologies from great britain they uh, introduced the third generation sequencing which now 
um, has uh, the most uh, most part of our hopes on the improving the sequencing and on the making it cheaper and more available for all labs. So basically, sequencing of DNA is based on polymerase chain reaction. I won't stop for a long time on that. Uh, the basic idea is that we have a DNA template strand in our tube, and then we make uh, several cycles. And during these cycles, uh, we increase exponentially the number of uh, target DNA that was eventually in our tube. We need to do that because we are we already can analyze single molecules, but we are not yet very amazing in that. So it's better to amplify the number of these molecules. To and uh, after that, we can uh, analyze them with our conventional methods. So PCR it's the amplification of uh, target molecules in our sample. And how does the next generation sequencing work? So the uh, pipeline is more or less the same. So first of all, we have an input DNA. So the DNA that we isolated from cell or tissue, from um, or sometimes it's a mix of DNA. For instance, we can isolate environmental DNA from a sample of soil, and then we have a mix of DNA of different microorganisms, fungi, and uh, even arthropods. Then this DNA must be fragmented to smaller pieces, and to each of the pieces will uh, a pair of adapters will be ligated, and then we make a PCR. Uh, the thing that um, you need to understand here is that for the beginning, we have one molecule, one target molecule, and then after several cycles of PCR, we have a cluster of molecules, and uh, they are copies of each other. So instead of one, we have several hundreds or several thousands on the same cluster. And it already allows us to record the response because um, the third step, the sequencing by synthesis, is a situation when we use these clusters on the solid substrate and uh, we put there sp a special modified nucleotides. Um, each nucleotide, we have four letters, right, in genome. Each letter has a special color, a, a special fluorescent dion it. And um, it's modified in the way that another nucleotide can't go upon this one. So when this nucleotide um, stands uh, in, in front of uh, our target DNA molecule, then it, it simply stays there and the fluorescence, fluorescence emission starts. The device, let's say, taking a picture of the colors and uh, your equipment knows uh, at which point of um, uh, at which point of your solid substrate, which nucleotide you have. And then you simply make it in cycles. Uh, you remove the nucleotides, then you put another nucleotide that can fluorescent. And basically like that, you can, uh, in, in normal situation, you can read up to 300 pairs of, uh, uh, up to 300 nucleotides on the solid substrate. It's only one of the technologies. There are several others with different modifications of PCR, with different modifications of nucleotides, but that is a very basic idea of how do we sequence genomes. And so in the end, you have uh, a lot of um, uh, a lot of so-called reads, uh, a, a lot of uh, short sequences of DNA. Usually in, in Illumina technology, we have like 150, and from these fragments of 150, you will need to assemble the genome of 3 billion par um, pairs of nucleotides. So, of course, uh, here you will use the very powerful computational approaches. Currently, uh, I already mentioned the third generation sequencing. This breakthrough made sequencing finally available for everyone. If uh, this situation, the next generation sequencing, it requires uh, equipment that costs around, um, I really don't know, in dollars, so sorry, now, now when course is so bad, I can't calculate fast, in rubles, it's around 20 million rubles. This one, the third generation sequencing, you can buy a cell for, let's say, 200,000. 
So the cost dropped significantly. And uh, this technology, it's very interesting and smart. It's yet developing because it, it yet has errors and reads and it needs to decrease it, decrease the number of errors be before we can use it everywhere. But definitely this is the next step for all of us of using these technologies in our labs. Uh, so it's based on a special, basically a protein. And um, the idea is that uh, DNA or even RNA from the solution uh, goes through this pore. And when it goes through this pore, uh, it's, it's also a buffer. So the ionic current exists. And uh, when together with these ions, the part of uh, the one strand of DNA goes through pore, the, the, uh, the change uh, occurs of uh, voltage of current and uh, each nucleotide makes its own size of this change so the program is able to recognize which nucleotide goes through pore right right now and um, the the big problem of these guys is that they can't recognize if you have so-called homopolymers for instance you have 50 adenines 50a uh, in um, the same uh, it, it, one by one let's say right and then it goes through pore, and for pore it's difficult to understand how many, because the current is the same, and pore can't understand how many homopolymers basically came through that. Was it 30, was it 50, was it 23? So it's a place where a really mistake occurs, but they're working on algorithms and on the structure of nanopores to improve it. So this is our future, really. Okay, so that was the basic idea how current genomics works. And uh, genomics itself, it's divided into two basic areas, it's structural genomics. And structural genomics uh, studies the physical nature of whole genome. And uh, it's functional genomics. Basically, today we will talk about functional genomics because we're interested in why uh, cells are functioning as they're functioning under the exposure of ionizing radiation. And functional genomics includes transcriptome, which is the entire range of transcripts produced by a given organism, and the proteome, which is the entire array of encoded proteins of the organism, and also metabolomics. So just one slide about structural genomics, and we won't stop on that. It uh, studies the content and the organization of genome information. So sometimes we know the gene, because we sequence the genome, we know the sequence of the gene, uh, we know the structure, but we don't know which protein it encodes and what does this protein do. So this is the structural genomics area where they study the spatial 3D structure of protein molecules encoded in genome. And uh, using usually strong uh, computer modeling, they're trying to understand what these proteins basically can do in, um, in the cell. And then where they have predictions, uh, scientists in experiments started to check this prediction, if it is true, if this protein is really exist, and does it have the, pro the properties that was predicted by structural genomicists. So, and functional genomics. Functional genomics basically studies the phenotype. So it studies how the information that is encoded in genome, how it is realized, so from the gene to the trait. And of course, um, it is uh, completely based on the interaction of a cell or tissue we're studying with environment. So um, we will talk today about transcriptomics, proteomics, and metabolomics as parts of functional genomics. First of all, it's transcriptomics. Transcriptomics studies transcriptomes, which is a complete set of RNA transcripts which are produced under the genome. And generally, we are interesting in matrix RNA, because the RNA is that will go for translation and that will finally uh, give us a protein, so that will be realized as a phenotype. But also recently a lot of attention is paid to so-called non-coding RNAs, and there are also specific approaches how to study them using transcriptomics. I simply won't start on that today. Uh, the overview of RNA sequencing really resembles the one for the DNA sequencing. We only have one extra step. So first of all, we extract not, not DNA, we extract the uh, RNA with poly A tail. So basically it's a matrix RNA, mRNA, 
And then we need to convert. RNA is a very unstable molecule. And in order to analyze it, we need to convert it to so-called complementary DNA or cDNA. And there is a specific step, which is called reverse transcription. And we convert all our RNAs to DNA. And then this DNA we analyze in just the same way as usual DNA. So what information we basically can receive from the transcriptome? Uh, here is, uh, this one is uh, an article where scientists try to unravel the uh, functional basement of radiation resistance of a fungi or of a cryptococcus neoformans to uh, irradiation. And uh, the most widespread way to analyze transcriptome is to do the enrichment, gene ontology enrichment. Gene ontology is a unique system which basically divides each gene and each uh, protein by their molecular function, by biological process in which they take part, and by cellular compartment, so where basically the protein works. And um, in this case, you can see that they irradiated cryptococcus neoformans, then they took um, mRNA 30 minutes after radiation, 60 minutes and two hours, and analyzed what basically changed in comparison with non-irradiated um, cryptococcus. And uh, you can see that some genes, the enrichment, it basically tells you which biological processes in the irradiated sample is um, uh, activated or suppressed in comparison with control. And of course, the more uh, let's say the bigger bars you have, the more evident is the effect. And you can see that two hours after radiation, the cryptococcus was basically showing a significant uh, activation of processes which have something to do with post-translational modifications. Uh, translation itself was suppressed, amino acid metabolism and transport was suppressed, and it is very general response to radiation after several hours. In fact, on many organisms we see that the translation stops, that amino acid metabolism stops because uh, the organism needs to repair the breaks that occurred. So uh, here uh, they basically see the, uh, they found several unique genes that they didn't know before. So they found a unique transcription factor. Uh, they described the domain in this factor, transcription factor, you remember, it's a protein that can control how another genes work in the cell. And sometimes transcription factors control uh, hundreds of another genes. And this transcription factor that they found served as a regulator of gamma radiation resistance of um, cryptococcus because it controls the expression of DNA repair genes. So what does it give to us? Basically, now after this work, we have an idea what can uh, make um, microorganisms uh, resistant to irradiation. And uh, also, this is a very good material for genetic engineering, right? So we know that these transcription factors works pretty nice to make organism resistant. We can look for its homologs in another species, and we can try to modify its work in order to make organism more resistant. So here is another example. This is a work from um, uh, Chernobyl area, and uh, here was uh, studied the transcriptome of um, radiosensitive species, pine, ra radiosensitive pines. And it was found that uh, it, this, this is three sites with very different levels of um, radioactive contamination. And there was found that um, on these three sites, there are se seven genes, C5, which expression is suppressed and to which expression is uh, upregulated, which basically are shared among uh, plots with very different types of radiation and with very different absorbed doses. And when we start to look on their function, we can see that they're involved in uh, cell death, in abscisic acid signaling. Abscisic acid is a stress phytohormone of plants to stomatal closure. And we can already predict how basically plants would adapt to to the uh, chronic radiation exposure in nature, which often occurs after radiation disasters. Another example also with plants. So for instance, this is a situation when using radiation mutagenesis, um, 
scientists received several so-called dwarf mutants of wheat. You see that they have different phenotypes. They are significantly smaller than wild type plants. And uh, they tried to reveal where basically mutation occurred. They used um, also the transcriptomic approach. And they found that mutations occurred in, um, this is just one example, of course, they, are, they analyzed uh, all the cultivars that they showed there. But for these examples, they found that uh, mutation occurred in regions which were associated with ribosomes, with starch and sucrose metabolism, and with protein processing in endoplasmic reticulum. And analyzing this data, they found several target genes that they can use later in order to understand if they give this dwarf phenotype or not. So just imagine if we don't have the transcriptomic approach and we want to understand why these plants are small. It would be barely impossible to make plausible working hypothesis and to understand where the changes occurred. But with transcriptomics, they managed to uh, narrow very much the area where they will search for the target gene. So uh, this is the example uh, here, the humans were studied, the monocytes in peripheral blood. And uh, it is, um, th this work studied the transcriptomic response uh, in these cells of people who are living in Kerala coast. You might know that in Kerala coast, uh, it's um, naturally enhanced radioactivity area, and they have up to 45 uh, milligrays per year, if I'm not mistaken, the, the absorbed dose can reach there, so much higher than in another regions of the world. And in this work, they compared uh, several control groups from the ground uh, levels of uh, radiation and uh, from Kerala group. And they indeed found that individuals in Kerala group were, were characterized by the significant upregulation of uh, a lot of processes that are normally associated with DNA damage response. And authors consider that as the radioadaptive response, as a response that allows people in Kerala cost to survive such an increased level of background radiation. So also several examples about proteomics approach. Proteomics is the large scale study of proteomes and the proteom is a set of proteins which are induced in an organism systems or by a certain biological context. The approach is a little bit uh, different and in fact, um, it's harder than to work with nucleic acids. So uh, there are two ways to study transcriptomes. This is the one of the oldest, it's so-called two-dimensional electrophoresis, where um, uh, in, in two dimensions we, we put basically the mix of proteins and then uh, we apply the voltage and these proteins make this 3D picture. And by just by comparing this picture from the control sample and from the sample that was irradiated, we can visually identify each each, um, each spot, right? It's a protein. And we can visually identify where we have uh, the bigger concentration or the smaller concentration of a protein comparing with the control. So before mass spectrometry was developed, this was one of the main methods of analyzing proteomes. And you can imagine that it didn't give much information about function of this protein. So we could visualize, we could say that indeed these proteins were changed, but we wouldn't say um, what these proteins basically do. And uh, currently, current proteomics, it's um, a little bit more uh, la laborish, let's say. So you take a protein mixture. The protein mixture is um, treated for proteolytic digestion. And then instead of protein mixture, we have a peptide mixture, which goes to uh, liquid chromatograph chromatography mass spectrometry systems. And then we receive so-called MSMS spectra, uh, which are characteristic for each peptide and each protein. And there is specific protein databases. Uh, again, we compare our spectra from our sample against these protein databases, and we can identify which proteins 
were in our original sample. So, for instance, this is the example of uh, mass spectrum of uh, insulin. How does it look like? We see that different isotopes can be seen, and uh, on a ratio also between these isotopes, it is possible to understand which protein is here. So, proteomics, uh, uh, if you ask me, it is one of the most difficult uh, omic technologies in uh, analysis also. And uh, here is an example where in uh, 2008, uh, the scientists studied the cell cultures of uh, human cells, and uh, one of the lines were mutated, but by one very important kinase, which is known to be involved in DNA repair response to radiation. Uh, so uh, they found that these two lines, they were very different in their purine metabolism, and they found exactly uh, the proteins which were uh, responsible for purine metabolism and which were so-called differentially expressed between normal line and between mutated line. And, and uh, so they understood that this kinase that was turned off in um, one of the lines, that it basically regulated the purine metabolism, which is uh, absolutely necessary for DNA repair processes. Uh, another uh, you see, I'm jumping from plants to uh, worms to humans, because basically now we can study radiobiology of everything using these techniques. And this work um, uh, checked how the proteome of C. elegans, which is a model organism, it's a worm, and uh, how, how does its protein respond to acute and chronic gamma radiation. And they found, um, so here you can see it's very similar to the um, enrichment analysis of transcriptome that I showed. Also here some enrichment in proteins which are responsible for different biological functions that are changed in comparison with non-irradiated uh, organisms. And uh, they managed to find here several proteins that were associated with reproductive decline and also to understand how these proteins basically were involved in reproductive decline and why the reproductive success of C. elegans was lower after radiation in comparison with um, control worms. Um, another, another example, this is, I, I decided to show something about space radiation also. So this was um, the work where they simulated space radiation on tom tomato and they analyzed the proteome of roots. So they simulated using gamma rays, using x-rays, and on this picture you can see uh, the combined approach to proteomics. I mean, they use both 2D electrophoresis and also the current and the most modern approach of mass spectrometry. So first of all, they made the 2D electrophoresis and uh, by red circles you can see the proteins that were different between irradiated samples and control samples. What they do next? They cut this part on the gel and they isolate exactly this protein. So they isolate the protein because they want to know the function exactly of this protein. They don't need to analyze the full mixture. And then these proteins were put to mass spectrometry and their uh, spectra were identified. And uh, so then again, search in the database, the um, function of these proteins also was found. And you can see that they identified the simulated space radiation, basically changed the expression of some important proteins, such as ATP synthase, heat shock protein, several of them. Uh, and basically the ITP synthase. This is the important thing because uh, the ITP synthesis, it's extremely important for maintenance, normal growth of plants, basically of any organism. And uh, that is also the place where scientists can think how to improve the situation, how to improve the plant growth in the space under condition of constant irradiation. Um, and uh, they didn't stop on that. The uh, currently bioinformatic methods allowed you to, so they identified all of these proteins that were differentially expressed. And then currently we have soft that allows to make networks. 
and to understand how these proteins or these uh, transcripts, these genes, if, if you want, uh, if you use transcriptomics, how do they associate with each other? And when you do these kind of associations, you can find so-called hubs. So the proteins that basically have the most amount of most number of connections with another proteins. And these hubs, it is your target for improvement. So when you found the hub, uh, you know that it probably it is the most important protein because it influences all other proteins. So you can already say what um, how, how the signal goes, what is upstream, what is downstream, what is just responding to the changing of another protein. So this is, um, you see that it's quite a fresh work and uh, basically this is an example of how currently the isomic works must be done. Okay, and the last, we yet have some time, right? And the last uh, omic technology I want to discuss today is metabolomics. Metabolomics, uh, um, technologically, it looks like proteomics pretty much. The difference that we also can use a gas chromatography for metabolomics. And uh, also metabolomics, it's one of the simplest omic technologies because we have the same metabolites. It doesn't matter where you took the glucose, where you took the lactate, was it from human, was it from the bacteria or plant, it's always the same. So the pipelines of metabolomics, they're very universal. Of course, if we are not talking about some specific metabolites that you can find only in the human body or only in plants, but basically all the basic metabolites, they're the same and it doesn't matter their origin for analysis of them. That's why metabolomics is more simple, simpler than another types of omic technologies. So the metabolome itself, it's a set of small metabolite molecules uh, and uh, we can uh, refer to a cell, to tissue, to the whole body. And usually we call metabolites, mo it's molecules with molecular weight less than one kilodalton. So it's small peptides, hormones, antibiotics, lipids, and secondary metabolites and all the metabolites of uh, main metabolic pathways such as Krebs cycle, glycolysis, beta oxidation of fatty acids, everything. And metabolic approach um, currently is recognized as a very powerful tool for diagnosis and for pro prognosis of diseases. And uh, if you start to search in the internet, you will find several databases on human metabolome on human blood metabolome, on human urine metabolome, because the combination of metabolites, the combination of metabolites, they uh, can be prognostic or predictive for uh, a current, for a special condition, for usually associated with disease. And uh, you, in these databases, you can even find the what is normal, right, and what is beyond normal, and what combination of several metabolites might need. So I don't know if some of you have this background that you need that. You can find uh, several important da databases on um, human health. It's human proteome and it's human metabolome. So uh, if, if you do some medical research, I highly recommend that check. Uh, basically, that's what metabolomics is working with. This is a significantly simplified scheme of metabolism. Uh, unfortunately, yeah, that's indeed simplified. And you can see that when we study metabolomics, we can basically find the hubs and the full pathways where the changes occur. So of course, all of these can be zoom, uh, zoom in and we see exactly what is uh, each pathway. Uh, source for. Here is an example of metabolomic study on spleen of mice that were exposed to gamma radiation. And um, researchers found that uh, several, um, several pathways were enriched and concentrations of metabolites were higher in spleens of irradiated mice in comparison with control ones. You see that leucine, lactate, uracil, creatinine, so basically glutathione, which is a protective peptide, um, methylhistidine and everything. And it makes you to, it allows you to predict the, let's say, the output of exposure. 
when you know which uh, metabolites will decrease or increase their concentrations, then with some luck, and if it is studied, you can understand what is going to happen next, what will be the outcome for the cell or for the tissue or even for the organism, if the organism is simple enough. Uh, another example also on mice, it's a metabolomic analysis of uh, different tissues of mice that were exposed to gamma radiation, and uh, they revealed the systematic understanding, as they call it, of total body exposure. Basically, in each tissue, they found um, several um, several metabolites. They changed their concentrations. Uh, the concentrations could be increased or decreased. And uh, in each of the tissue, they found so-called predictors. So basically, the metabolites uh, using which you can understand the response of tissue to gamma radiation. And also one example with plant. This is a metabolic profiling of gamma irradiated barley. Uh, sometimes when you irradiate plants with low dose, uh, their growth can be improved. And uh, the mechanisms of that is yet not understand well. So in this work, it was shown that um, in seedlings of irradiated seeds, we have uh, a significant change in nitrogen metabolism, relocation of nitrogen between roots and shoots of irradiated plants, and also that uh, ascorbate system, uh, ascorbic acid, the detoxific detoxification of reactive oxygen species, which also takes part in um, in uh, the responses, growth responses, that it also takes part in response to low dose gamma radiation and might be involved in stimulation of growth. So uh, I was hurrying up a little bit because I wasn't uh, uh, sure that we will finish in time, but we are already in the end. And uh, I want to say that the advantage of omic technologies over traditional approaches is their ability to analyze at the same time a large number of molecules to receive a holistic picture of biological process or a certain developmental stage. And also we can go from omics levels, we can go to systems biology. And if on the same object we receive the data on genome, transcriptome, proton, metabolome, we can integrate them and we can um, empower a lot our understanding of the process. Of course, mm, the main problem of that, it's very expensive. Uh, not all labs can really uh, have access to this because, um, for instance, uh, currently the analysis of uh, 12 samples on um, for, for, for transcriptomics, for high throughput transcriptomics, you would pay at least a thousand dollars for a sample for this analysis. So this is quite expensive, let's say. And um, we really look forward for the development of the technology. Currently, the third generation sequencing gives us some hope that soon er, uh, each of us will be able to use this in our current practice. And uh, if uh, you were interested in any part of the lecture, I can um, reply to your questions. I basically specialize on transcriptomics and metabolomics, but I have some ideas about genomics and proteomics also. And uh, here are some resources for self-education. I know that you will have the um, presentation available, so you can check here if you want to go deeper. Uh, thanks a lot, and I'm ready to answer your questions. Thank you, Paulina, for a great lecture. Uh, are there any questions you can raise hands? Or if you're a host, you can unmute yourself on your own. Are there any questions once again? Well, I hope it was clear. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was quite clear, yeah. Even I am not a, an expert in radiobiology, but I understood it was pretty clear for me. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay. So if there are no questions, then I would like to thank uh, Dr. Polina Volko once again for attending and giving this lecture. And uh, I would like to remind everyone that at 2 o'clock at 2 p.m. we will start our uh, parallel sessions. So now have a great lunch.
Thank you, everybody, for attending. Thanks a lot. Have a nice day. Goodbye. Bye-bye.